All right, folks, welcome to our episode six extras. Uh, I am here with one of our seminar guests today, Mauro Bautista, uh, who's been good enough to join us for a little extra discussion. Um, just as a refresher, uh, Mauro is principal at the Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez High School, uh, which is located in Boyle Heights uh, on the east side of Los Angeles. And uh, Mauro, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for the invite. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to hear from you today. Um, before we get into kind of continuing the discussion about school culture, I'm wondering if you can maybe uh, share the story of your school, because um, I've heard you tell this story. Uh, I think it's really powerful and um, perhaps unfortunately is a, a story about the, a chapter in our nation's history that many people, at least outside of California, might not be aware of. Um, but it's a great story and a powerful one, especially maybe at this moment in history. So tell us a little bit about um, your school and uh, the name of your school, the legacy of your school. Well, I'm always uh, excited and, and happy to share the story of our school. Our school's name is Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez High School. Uh, it was named after Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez, who in the early 1940s uh, attempted to enroll their daughter, Sylvia Mendez, in their neighborhood school. Uh, this is in Westminster, uh, California, in Orange County. And at the time, of course, uh, Sylvia Mendez was denied enrollment in the elementary school uh, because of the color of her skin. At that time, schools were segregated in California and throughout the United States. Uh, and so the family did something very courageous at the time. Uh, they got together with other families in a coalition that was actually very diverse, and they sued the school district. Uh, Mendez versus Westminster made its way up to federal courts. And in 1947, in Mendes v. Westminster, uh, the federal courts ruled that uh, separating students or segregating students based on the color of their skin was unconstitutional. And so uh, se segregation became illegal in the state of California. Now, this becomes uh, even more prominent because in the world famous 1954 Brown versus Board of Education case, Thurgood Marshall used the Mendes case as a president case when he argued Brown versus Ward. And so uh, we oftentimes at Mendez say that it's an incredible honor to be working at a school named after the Mendez family. Uh, Sylvia Mendez, uh, Gonzalo Mendez, and other family members from the Mendez family consistently visit our school and talk to our students, talk to us, the staff. And so we feel that we have uh, a great legacy to uphold and that it's our responsibility not just to go to school and have this mediocre school that could be any school in any uh, urban school district, but rather that we have to have a school where our students are excelling uh, because of uh, Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez. Yeah. Uh, I, so I love that story, and especially my background. You know, I came to LA from New York City where, um, you know, Many schools have names, but many schools are also really commonly referred to as, you know, PS 226 or MS 251, these sort of institutional sounding names. So to come to L.A. and and see uh, and have a chance to work with a school that, uh, you know, is named after this incredible, uh, you know, historic case and, and family, this courageous family, um, it was just a nice breath of, of <laughs> fresh air for me. So I, every time I come to campus, yeah. I, I'm like, ah, yes, I'm, well, I'm, for, I'm here in the legacy. <laughs> yeah. For a little bit, it was known as East LA High School number one. So okay, there well, you go. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, the community got together yeah. and, um, yeah. you know, definitely a push by a local community organization called Inner City Struggle. And the, the community, they, uh, they pushed to have the school named after Felita and Gonzalo Mendez. And I'm glad, I'm glad they did. Yeah. So uh, maybe kind of continuing down this line just a little bit, something I find also um, a striking testament to, uh, to your school and to the work that you and the staff have done uh, at Mendez is I'm, I'm not familiar with very many high schools in urban settings in America where you could, where what I'm about to say is true, where uh, the principal uh, lives in the community, is from the community, sends his own children to his school in the community. And when there are multiple teachers on staff who have sent their own children um, to the school or are planning to send their younger children to the school. Um, and I'm wondering if you can share, since we've been talking so much about school culture 
Um, what do you think uh, that fact about Mendes High School says about the school um, and, uh, and about the culture that you've built? Definitely. So we've, been, we've been very blessed the last five years to have really positive uh, academic data, uh, increase in graduation rate, um, increase in uh, state exam results, increase in AP, increase in the percentage of students taking AP classes and an increase in the percentage of students passing AP classes. So the last five years from Mendes High School has been, have been really good academically, but it all could not happen without the school, school culture piece. And in fact, now that you bring up uh, the number of staff members who have sent their children to Mendes, often when I'm asked, and I am often asked this question, which data piece do you consider the most significant for Mendes? The one I share is the fact that we've had over uh, 15 teachers who have either sent uh, their child to Mendes and they have graduated, moved on to college, or are currently uh, sending their, their children to Mendes. And this upcoming year, rising ninth graders, we have three, uh, three unique parents, staff members, who are now sending their children to Mendes and who will be ninth graders at, at Mendes High School. So it, um, it could not happen these uh, educators who have the possibility of sending their kids really anywhere. I mean, they could send them to their neighborhood public high school. They could also send them to a charter school. They could apply for a magnet and send them to a magnet school. And quite possibly they could even enroll them in a private school. Um, they do so obviously because they've seen our strength in academics, but interconnected to that is they do so because they know that their son or daughter is going to be coming to a safe school where they're going to have multiple opportunities to connect beyond academics. Uh, if, they, if they're interested in computer science, we have a whole computer science sequence. If they're interested in athletics, we have a pretty robust athletic program that continues to grow uh, every year. If they're interested in visual and performing arts, we have um, more and more, we're, we've, we've uh, expanded our vision and performing arts program. Um, our connections to the communities are strong, and so we have a lot of opportunities for students to participate in uh, community organizations or community uh, events. And so school culture has been key in our academic success, uh, and school culture has been key in having all of these uh, parents, all of these staff members who are parents and trusting us uh, with their education, with the education of their son or daughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, something else about the school I think that's that's fascinating. I'd love to um, kind of unpack with you here is that the the Mendez that you're describing now was not always the the story <laughs> of Mendez High School. And um, say eight years ago or so, to have a high school with, um, I think the graduation rate was somewhere in the 30s. Um, and now to have a graduation rate that's well above 90%, um, to have a school where 95% of the students report on surveys that they feel safe um, on campus and to have staff who are sending their, their own children to the school, that's, that's quite a swing of the pendulum. And so I'm wondering if you can share a bit about the, the work and, and um, what you guys did, which I think in many ways um, is, is a journey that a lot of schools uh, in um, low-income areas in urban America, but also in rural America, uh, you know, are trying to make and are, and are working on. Um, but you all have obviously figured out some things that have, have worked well in your context. So tell us a bit about that, the, the journey of the, the old Mendez to the new Mendez. Well, as I respond to that question, I first want to acknowledge uh, Principal Gavin and Dr. Ortiz, who were the, uh, the two principals that opened the campus when we were two schools. Uh, and I was right there with them. And I think all three of us were trying to learn at a time where LAUSD was open, where op LAUSD at that time was opening up new schools that were small schools. But many of us that were opening these schools came from traditional large schools. Hmm. Uh, you know, Ms. Gavin coming from Fremont, myself coming from Hollenbeck. 
And I think early on we struggled to understand how a small school worked um, for multiple reasons, but obviously our only experience had been in large comprehensive schools. Um, and so I think um, Ms. Gavin and, and Dr. Ortiz did, did a great job opening the school and setting the foundation for what later became our success. Uh, I'm gonna give, I think, one story that talks about our success. Cause I, like I said earlier, I could talk for about two <laughs> hours on different things about Mendes. Um, but I think one story that's important that ties to the topic of today is um, in 2011, we hired, uh, at that time he was a PSA and then later became our assistant principal, Mr. Macias, mm -hmm. Alejandro Macias. Mr. Macias has an interesting background because he went to continuation school. He's a continuation school uh, product. Mm. And, and can, just for our audience, can you clarify what a continuation school Yeah, so school is? we have uh, what we consider our traditional high schools, 9 through 12, comprehensive. And when students uh, fall behind here in, in, in California or in L.A., when they fall behind in high school credits, and then at a certain point, it's going to be very difficult for them to meet the A through G requirements or the credits to graduate from a traditional California high school. Then we have continuation schools where students can go. Uh, it's a different pacing. It's a different even uh, school schedule. But students are able to make up some of those credits a little bit faster than in a traditional high school um, credit. So Mr. Macias at some point in his high school career fell behind. and. Um, and he was shipped out <laughs> to a continuation high school. Mm. So early when Mr. Macias joined us, we had a situation with a student and uh, we were both talking to the student. And Mr. Macias took his time asking students questions. Um, whereas I fell in the trap of, no, like your experience the same thing I experienced, you're experiencing the same thing many of us experience. You just got to work harder mm. or just get your act together. But my experience was not like this particular student's experience. Mm. My experience was very traditional. I was fortunate enough to be to succeed in, in K through 12 and then moved on to college. This student was obviously struggling. But Mr. Macias asked many questions. He, he in essence, did his job as a counselor. He counseled mm. the student. And he asked many questions about why the student was struggling, what was going on at home, what were some of the barriers that the student was facing. And the student opened up. And thereafter, uh, Mr. Mm. Macias was able to connect them to some programs uh, that were actually be able to help them out. But that, I think, begins the journey of Mendes High School um, trying to partner with community organizations and and try to offer students who are struggling the support they need. Students who are struggling do not come to school with the mindset of, man, I'm gonna go to school today and I'm gonna fail. I'm gonna go to school today and I'm gonna act up in period two because I wanna get in trouble. They do not come with that mindset. But there are so many other issues that are going on uh, in their own personal lives, possibly in their home lives, that need, that need extra support, not just the in classroom support of teacher providing a lesson and the student then uh, responding to that lesson. But they may need counseling, they may need therapy, they may need uh, extra tutoring, they may need to be connected to a community organization that's gonna follow up with them on a daily basis to make sure that they're coming to school, they're turning in their work. And so I think that's a key component of our success is uh, being able to establish uh, safety nets uh, for students that are struggling mm. and not just fall back on this idea of like, hey, we did it, so you can do it as well. Yeah, we did it, but uh, we experienced success in school, so we don't quite understand mm. the challenges that our students who are struggling are, are going through, so we have to connect them to those resources. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think there is um, there's a lot of discussion out there right now about um, what should happen and a lot of outrage about things like what we saw in Parkland, Florida, 
um, and, and rightful fear and concern and feeling of like, well, we've just got to do something to make sure this never happens again. Uh, and um, in that kind of context, uh, you know, as someone with a deep history working in schools and as a principal, um, as, uh, and I think, you know, as a father of school age children, um, you know, what is it that you wish that um, the public and kind of people that are out there saying we've got to do something, you know, arm the teachers or we've got to <laughs> do something, uh, you know, put bulletproof glass on the office or put more cops in schools or suspend all the bad kids or whatever it might be. Um, you know, if we assume those folks are coming from a good place, that they want these tragedies to stop, uh, what do you wish they knew um, that um, maybe isn't obvious to the public about what would actually help this situation? I think um, earlier you mentioned that, you know, I do live in the, in the neighborhood where I'm principal. Um, and earlier I was joking here that took me about 35 to 40 minutes to get here. That was a long ride. Because <laughs> usually I just have about a five minute. Triple your usual yeah. uh, walk down the street. <laughs> yeah. And I, and earlier you mentioned that I do have my, I already have one student, one of my own biological kids graduate from Mendes. My second one will be a rising senior this year. And then I have a seventh grader who goes to Hollenbeck, who will be a, a Jaguar and, and after she finishes her eighth grade year. And so those two aspects are important in terms of answering your question. So I think about, you know, these students are not just my students, but they're also my neighbors. Mm. Their parents are their neighbors. And so as a neighbor, how do I want to be able to interact with these students in the community? In other words, when I see them in the community, no matter what happens at Mendes High School, can I hold my head up high and look them in the eye and know that I treated, I treated them with the utmost respect and dignity, and I provided them, to the best of my abilities, the best opportunity for them to succeed. And if they weren't succeeding, then i do everything I could to help them at Mendes High School before even thinking about other alternatives. As the father of, a, of biological children at the school, I think about, like, I mean, in my case, it's easy. Like, what do I want for my kids, mm. right? Like, what do I want for my own biological kids? I certainly don't want them to be search and want, mm. right, when they haven't done anything wrong. Um, and so to answer your question, thinking about what I think uh, schools can do is that schools, in addition to doing the very best that schools can to provide the best and most rigorous uh, instruction to prepare the students for high school and beyond, for college, Schools have to provide a safe, nurturing school culture. They have to, it has to be part of the vision. It has to be part of the day-to-day -day work where students come to campus and in their minds, not at all, is whether they're gonna be safe or not. It's an automatic. Like I'm going to mend this, it's not even on my mind whether I'm gonna to have to worry about safety on school because I know it's already taken care of, but that's a lot of work on the school's part. Also, there has to be the work uh, done with connecting, making the students connect, feel connected to the school. I think a lot of times our students that struggle the most are possibly the ones that put, uh, uh, pose some imminent danger end up being the ones that are not connected to the school. They're not connected to school, not connected to other adults, not connected to some kind of program at school. So the school has to be able to offer this very diverse set of opportunities for students to connect. Then we have to message the students, we want them to get connected. Mm. Like we want you to, if you're not an athlete, then maybe arts, if you're not art, maybe this other program. And whenever a staff member or another child comes to us and says, hey, we want to start this club, it doesn't exist. Like, yes, please, how do we do it? So that more students can then be connected to the school. And earlier in the show, I talked about the importance of constantly being in communication with families. Um, you know, just keeping families updated about what's going on in school, trying to be proactive instead of reactive, trying to tell them about what we're doing to keep their son or daughter safe um, instead of react after something something happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, you know, if, if I had my way model, we could talk for another two hours because <laughs> uh, uh, I think there's so much depth to what you're saying, but um, we are out of time for today. Again, uh, I want to thank uh, our guest, Model Bautista, 
uh, principal at Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez High School uh, in Boyle Heights on the east side of Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. No, thank you for the invite. This was a lot of fun. All right, uh, folks, uh, as always, you can check out all of our content at our website. That's aotashow.com.